Hey, Gary. Put on my QMS shirt for today. And so did Carl. So we encourage you to go ahead and turn on your cameras. You can't be that shy anymore. I mean, we've been doing this now for several months. I get it up. Oh, see, there goes Brian. He came on video real quick. So I guess it was wear your black QMS shirt to, to work today. Nancy, did you wear your black QMS shirt? So here comes people and I won't be like happy. So I won't be able to um I won't be able to really watch that because I'll, I'll actually be driving the first part of this presentation. So um, just introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. My name is Mike Krug. Um, I'm actually out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I've been consulting uh, with QMS and, and in the SAP quality space for the past 23 going on 24 years. Um, I'm one of the principal consultants in QMS along with Carl. Carl, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure, Carl Dunlap, uh, QMS. Um, as Mike said, the two of us are the principal and owners of QMS and also have uh, been working in QM, implementing quality systems within SAP QM for the past, uh, geez, I don't even know anymore, 25 years or so. You usually have to add, 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 add one to days. me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we actually like these to be extremely fun. Um, you know, if you have questions, please ask, you know, uh, if you're muted, you can unmute yourself or what I, I think, right, Carl? And yep. um, if not, Carl can make sure you get unmuted or throw them in the chat. If you if you don't want to speak up on the thing, we get it. Um, but the, these are meant to be interactive. They're really meant to be more of a learning opportunity and show you some things that we, we've done today. So um, we're going to be focused today on really kind of audit management and calibration and showing you kind of what we've done from a Fiori perspective. Again, if you have any, you know, functional or technical related questions around uh, these two topics. We're happy to answer any of those as well as anything else, uh, anything, anything else quality. Um, we really, you know, for those of you that may not be that familiar with QMS, we've really built a reputation around being probably the global, you know, leader in the, our subject matter expertise from a quality perspective with regards to SAP solutions. So we're involved uh, in a lot of that things, everything SAP does quality. In fact, right now we're, we're, we're sitting in on some of the, the new topics like the supplier 8D uh, uh, web-based solution that they have, cloud-based solution, and as well as the, the new QIM piece that's starting to, to form up as well. So happy to, happy to make this as, as meaningful for you. And we're just uh, glad that you all um, attended today. So um, just to kind of give you a quick uh, highlight of what other things are going on. Obviously, we're, we're in the new normal. Uh, Sapphire didn't happen this year. So we're trying to, we're going to be trying to up our webinars. Uh, there are a couple things that are uh, actually scheduled that are also happening is Timken's going to be discussing their um, implementation of QIM, where they really do everything from um, you know, cor corrective actions, preventative actions, customer complaints, 8Ds, PPAPs, um, they have CRM, C4C integration, et cetera. They've really done a really nice job uh, in a full-blown implementation of quality issue management um, with their system. I also, since I actually have the mic and I can, and, and Nancy said hello, uh, wanna wish Nancy the best. She's retiring after a long time with Timken, the end of next week, so Nancy, we, we uh, say thank you to you. Um, if any of you all have any questions on, from a business perspective on what you can do better to, you know, make your projects more successful, Nancy's one of the best I've worked with in the past 23 years. Um, in fact, week two, I was trying to talk her into adding more functionality to the solution instead of less. So, um, and Rochelle is, uh, is, is taking over the reins there for her, but a great team. And we wish Nancy all the, the happiness and, and uh, fun that comes along with retirement after she gets past this, uh, this little ASEG webinar on October 22nd. But, um, and then Ray Tucker and Carl also do a, a series of think tanks um, with ASEG. Um, are those monthly, Carl? Uh, every other month. Yeah. Every other month. So different topics and they're really meant to be more engaging. So not more of a lecture type thing, but you know, share your experiences, share what you're doing. Um, you know, they have will have different topics and things. They've had Germany come in and, and speak about what's new in, in, in S4 and where, where the solution's heading. So some good information on those. If you have any questions, reach out to Carl or myself and we can get you aligned with when those are happening. So um, so all right, auto management and calibration. So, you know, kind of what's in standard SAP, why Fiori, what are the benefits? So we'll kind of try to hit some of that today. Um, 
but really to talk through some of these stuff. And, and the good news is we're not going to do death by PowerPoint today. We've just got a few slides and then we're going to actually launch into the Fiori apps and kind of show you what we've been doing. But you may be, you may have heard a lot about this new, you know, this new concept SAP has been really selling around the, the intelligent enterprise. And I did a lot of research on this and really, but it really what it, it, it stands for is it says basically the way that we work should be as seamless or more seamless than the way that we live. Um, if you think about the way you live, your smartphone has changed everything. In fact, um, before COVID, I was, uh, I was in um, Newport News, Virginia, and we were doing a series of workshops, and, and uh, I was trying to explain this to, to one of the business people. He goes, hey, I get it. He goes, normally I print a paper ticket at the airport, you know, before I, you know, when I get to the airport, and he goes, for whatever reason, I checked in on my phone, and when I got to the airport, it knew I was there to ask me to check in, and then told me my flight was delayed and rescheduled me, and it was actually when some tornadoes went through Dallas or something, and he was able to get out before it happened, and, and all that was possible because he was, he was digital. He wasn't on paper. He was, you know, he was, he was basically making things very transparent for himself using his smartphone. And think about all the ways that we use our smartphones, you know, for banking or booking airline tickets or just social media, you know, and then think about it when you come to work <laughs> and you go into this system for that, there's something else for this thing, some other pro piece, of, other processes on paper, different plants are doing, doing different things. So really intelligent enterprises is looking at better ways to, you know, you know, basically optimize the way you're doing that to make it, you know, a much more intelligent, you know, user experience, you know, so, um, you know, you know, providing consistent, intelligent, integrated user experiences, simplification of the UX. I mean, we've uh, done many, many, many different evaluations of SAP functionality compared to, to, um, to third party systems. And at the end of the day, SAP technically can go toe to toe with any other really third party solution on the market. There may be some nuances and some differences, but where we always lost was usability um, because everything else had you know, gravitated to, towards you know, browser based solutions and, and much, much more user friendly and um, you know, you know, easier to learn and use, et cetera. And we just were a lot nicer. Um, and Fiori is really changing that. So, um, you know, not, not only is, is Fiori making it easier to use, but it's also a mobile solution. You know, it's allowing you to access your, your information anywhere, anytime, and really on any device. It will resize itself. We'll show you some of that as well. And then some of the newer technologies, and Tim can do in this, it enables B2B collaboration. You know, We've talked about business to business collaboration with suppliers and customers, et cetera, for years, but there's always been this little thing called a firewall that got in the way. Now with some of the cloud-based offerings, you know, that's pretty transparent. It's taking the clouds, handling the security, it's handling who can get in and it's, it's securely connecting to the back end to allow people to basically access information they need to access anywhere, anytime. So really some cool things that are happening. And then there's the whole, you know, um, internet of things that's also happening that we're incorporating into quality solutions. So really kind of a cool time to, to be part of, you know, IT and, and, you know, part of, you know, digital implementations and stuff. And, you know, when we go back to this at the end of the day, you know, I, I put the slide together, you know, several years ago and it, you know, people process technology, it all boils down to that, you know, and, you know, it's not just, you know, slapping on a, a nice user, you know, interface. It's also looking at your processes, looking at the way your people interact with the, the system, how knowledgeable they are, the system and stuff, and, you know, transforming your business processes and, and finding better, you know, newer, quicker ways to do things with technology, automating things, you know, bringing in information automatically, et cetera. But, you know, when you look at this, you know, kind of, and, and Rich came up with this, automate, innovate, simplify, transform, and optimize. It's really part of our quality digital transformation. Anytime we're talking to customers about what they want to do, we're taking this into account. So today we're really going to be talking about simplification, you know, and simplification through a fewer user interface. So starting with audit management, you know, um, for those of you that are not, you know, familiar with audit management and SAP, it's part of core. It's been part of core since uh, four seven, I believe, or EC. I think it's going to be four seven is when SAP inclu included as part of the core thing. And it was actually, I think originally part of CRM or something like that. And as they've been bolting on these different systems, they brought it in. Um, and Stephanie Motz over in Germany was, was, um, 
was responsible for this. I was sitting on uh, the, uh, a bus to a concert, you know, at Sapphire one time with her. And I said, hey, Stephanie, this is great, but the solution is really, a, you know, it's really easy to implement. It's pretty quick and stuff. And that's, that was by design. It's, you know, it allows you to you know, have all your building blocks from different question lists that you might conduct, it, you know, to conduct different audits to allowing the flexibility during an audit to add things. But it's usually a pretty quick and easy solution to implement. It's one of our quick hit, quick, hit, quick win things that we'll try to do if we're looking at a full-blown QMS. You know, it, it's it's usually a, a lower um, user group that, that we're dealing with compared to maybe inspections or some of the, you know, maybe the non-conformances where we're cross, cross departments and stuff like that. So it's, it's really a neat solution if you haven't seen it, you know. Um, the UI and the GUI is okay. Um, it actually was kind of, when they were trying some new things, it's a kind of a cross has multiple panes on, on, the, on the user interface and stuff. But at the end of the day, there's lots of clicking and, and you know, execution of the audit wasn't, you know, the easiest or, or the simplest. And there's different ways you could do that, you know, but really the feedback we always got from our customers on the solutions and, and they, you know, on this piece of functionality is they really liked it, but they needed a solution that's mobile. You know, um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the audits aren't conducted at the desk. You know, they'll come back to do an audit report at the desk, but, they need to be on the floor. They need to be at the supplier site, et cetera. So they need something that's mobile. Maybe that goes on a tablet now that tablets are out there. Um, you know, they need a quick and easy user interface, you know, ways to answer that. And there's different things that we can do functionally to simplify it, et cetera. But, you know, again, you know, from that mobility perspective, how do I get it in something that, you know, still big enough that I can do things with, but also small enough that, you know, that I, I don't have to carry around a laptop or stop what I'm doing, et cetera. So, um, and then, you know, for a lot of our people, it's not, it's not always just about execution of the audit, but the ability to quickly create new audits. If you're doing self-assessments or, you know, if, if you're in, in a different area and all of a sudden you're going to pop up and say, okay, I want to do this, is how do I do do that. So, you know, the feedback overall functionally on audit, audit management is good, but there's definitely been some gaps and some deficiencies that that we've looked to bridge. So what we've built here is, and we'll, we'll go into the system here in a second and show you basically, but we've built, um, you know, a Fiori application that would, you know, runs both on S4 as well as ECC. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we've been doing with Fiori and customers haven't been the customers with S4. It's been the customers with ECC that, you know, aren't planning to go to S4 for a couple of years, and they're looking to implement simplicity. They're looking to streamline a lot of the transactions that we've had in the past. There's different ways we can implement. We can talk about that down the road, but this, this will work on ECC. In fact, the system I'll be demoing on today is a backend ECC uh, six system. I think service feature pack, uh, service pack five, we're, we're not even on the latest greatest. We're actually talking about what we should do with it, but um, so it'll run on really whatever you want it to run on. So um, I really like this, this look. And so when you come into the audit monitor, we start with a work list. This is basically synonymous with your ALV grid in the system. So your, your QA32 transaction, your QM10 transaction, where it allow you to, to bring back a, a list of all different things. And in this case, it's the audits. And this would be also the same thing as the audit monitor. Um, you have filters in Fiori that allow you to narrow down your search, you enter in your, your search parameters and stuff and ways to, to skinny down this list. You can also filter this list. You can add fields to it, you know, through your little, your gear icon, just like you can. You can reorder your fields and you can save those and you can get your layout happy the way that you want to do. What I like about this too is we can incorporate different, basically filter buttons that will allow me to see everything maybe that's released or everything that's being prepared or things that are completed, you know, so the system will, will go through and whatever criteria will come up with will tell me, hey, you know, how, you know, how many do I have open that I, I need to deal with, et cetera. Um, it brings this actual number, this 207 audit, total audits back, you know, to your Fiori launchpad um, that's available, et cetera. We, you know, when we talk about use case too, depending on if you're talking about, you know, a mobile application or a desktop application, et cetera, a lot of times too, we incorporate additional functionality. So from here, you can create a new audit. You can also copy, you know, an audit, you know, if you have templates set up, et cetera. So it speeds it up. If you decide to click on an audit, you're going to get into it and you're going to see the different levels. You'll see, you know, different, you know, your question list, your elements, your different questions that you have. Um, and then depending on how you want to enter it, you know, or you, your audit, we put a quick edit so you can use this screen to, to quickly kind of go through, you know, from a tablet perspective. But if you have maybe like a an iPhone or a, or something like that, you know, you can also have a split screen where you can come through and, and say, okay, you know, here's the, 
here's the answer to the question, you know, you know, here's comments, long text, and you can create kappas and things like that as well. Um, this at some levels of, you know, is, is a, a baseline application that we have. So we don't have all the functionality in it. You know, a lot of times customers will say, hey, we want to do this, we want to do that. But depending on what they're looking to do, you can, you can incorporate different ways to do that, et cetera. So um, if you're going to create it too, there's lots of different tools that Fiori allows you to do. So if you like your guided process, maybe that you fell in love and QIM, you can have an audit, you can have a, a Fiori application that'll take you through one step at a time. And I'll kind of show you how that works today. Um, and then, you know, you also have different ways to copy things and, you know, access different stuff. So there's different, basically baseline Fiori templates that we can use that we've used and we've highlighted different use cases for these, for the different, basically, you know, functionalities that we've implemented across the board. So, um, so let's jump into the, you know, the, uh, the web here real quick. Let me see here. Let me, let me close this down and we'll just go into it. So um, I'm actually, I don't think I'm on my VPN, but it doesn't matter if I am or not. So when I come into here, you know, I have a, a shortcut for lots of fun things, but if I click on my supplier quality hub, it's really kind of where we have all of our, our applications. And so this is SAP cloud platform. Um, we're, we're leveraging a cloud platform that just allows us to access this from anywhere without being connected to the VPN. Again, the cloud services is connecting to our backend through what's called the, the cloud connector. So that's happening on the back end, and then all the security happens on the front end. Um, depending if you're using like, you know, SAP Cloud flat Platform, Azure, you know, a lot of times you have the ability to, um, to set up different services. So if you wanted, you know, um, suppliers or even users to come in and, and self-register or self-password reset, you can do that. Somebody can assign security on the back end. Um, if I forget my password, again, I don't have to call up, you know, Carl, you know, at the help desk and say, hey, Carl, reset my password. I can do that. And, you know, it saves, you know, all, all your, your three security questions and, and different things, et cetera. We can actually have two-part authentication. We don't have that on. So, um, and I'm not FTA GMP if I have any of my friends from there in here. So I have my thing that saves my password. So um, this is kind of our, our, our showcase of different apps that we play with. And you know, today we're going to focus on the audit management app. Um, we're also going to focus on um, the calibration app that's down here. So if you have any other questions on things, you know, this is some of, there's a lot of things that we've done with suppliers and stuff like that, you know, from supplier self-service of maintaining information to supplier corrective action, supplier result entry, um, some reporting, et cetera, um, supplier scorecarding, et cetera. But I'm going to go into the app for the, uh, for the audit piece that I have. Um, and this could be limited to supplier apps if I was just doing a supplier thing. Right now I have it basically set up to read everything, you know, in my enterprise. So I'm not limiting it by anything. I'm not, I'm not having it, you know, just, you know, read certain types of audits. Um, if you're familiar with audit management, we can have, you know, we might have layer process audits, we might have uh, self-assessments, you know, different assessments, et cetera, that it can read. Uh, we're bringing in all different audit types that are here, and, and I could filter this list and stuff like that by this. So when this comes in, I can see I have, I have 208 audits, which was on, on my Fiori launchpad. Um, it's going through right now, determining the logic of how many of these different things are, are in preparation and stuff like that and, and released, et cetera. Um, and I can scroll through this. Now, I have it reading everything. So when I scroll down, you'll see here, it's going to think some more. And what happens is from a performance perspective, you know, you might say, well, I have thousands of audits in my system. One cool thing about Fiori is there's basically a backend service called an OData service that technically the front end is communicating with. And that, that backend service is only basically serving up so many at a time. You know, so from a, a speed and efficiency perspective, it can keep it, you know, rather quick. So if I continue to scroll down, it'll, it'll bring in blocks of 50 or whatever, and then it'll go get the next set of 50, and then I can continue to scroll down. So if I wanted to see everything I could, um, uh, you know, for, for giggles and grins, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, if I wanted to see, you know, now it's coming here, you know, it's, it's done. If I wanted to see the completed audits, maybe they're in a status that I need to, um, you know, I need to actually take action and approve those completed audits, I can do this. And, and notice, you know, we can use some visual things and stuff. I mean, obviously, these are not all completed, but I can, I can have, you know, basically status bars to say, hey, this is completed, and this one's completed with outstanding action. So that's the status on the audit, et cetera. So maybe I could go through or approve it and close it out, et cetera. So I can use these to, to give me different views, um, different ways to quickly see the different information that, that I, I want to see. Um, if I go back to all here, 
And if I'm going too fast, slow me down. I, uh, I tend to talk kind of quickly, but um, kind of show you the features and functions. Um, just like with any LV grid, you know, this may not be re relevant to me. So what I, I want to do here is I want to come into here. Obviously, I can put in the type, you know, the audit number. Maybe I have a naming convention. I could do that. But I'm actually, you know, going to be focused on my, my vendor audits. So when I filter this list down, if I put in a grouping, um, you know, I can then just get the five audits that are that are relevant to um, the supplier audits or, or the grouping that I've set. So the grouping in the sort field is standard fields on the on the audit that that you know, regardless of audit type that are always there. So we we use that as a filter bar. Um, people say, well, why don't you you know allow us to, to to do by the audit object? It gets a little bit tech, uh, a little bit more technical and tricky to do that. You can you can absolutely absolutely do that if you want. But um, we've chosen you know using the grouping field and stuff to make it quick and simple that allows me to come into here. So. If I wanted to go into an audit, so you see here, I have a little arrow here, so I can click on really anywhere um, on the on the uh, on the line of the actual individual audit, and I can kind of come into the actual audit questions that are specific for this. So these are just simple questions, you know, that that you can do. So I, I see I've got the question list, the element. Um, I'm going to turn these into it so they're kind of more grayed out and maybe we're rolling up some of the some of the data, et cetera. But um, for now, I've got different questions. Does the vendor deliver to a DC? Does it deliver through the XDoc? Does it, you know, does it do these different things? If I wanted to answer the questions, again, I can just click on it and it's going to bring up a side panel for me. So, you know, from here I can, you know, choose you know the change and I can say okay we're going to evaluate this and I'm going to say it conforms you know and I can also enter enter in some comments and things like that and and save that data and it will actually save that you know that question you know back to to the back end so now it's thinking with the back end and it's actually completing you know that actual question and, and providing that information back you know we could do that kind of at the end we could do that you know uh, one at a time because it is communicating with the back end i would probably want to do that more at the end but you have the ability to do that depending on how you want to to do that our system seems to be more on covid break today maybe lunch break it was a little bit slower so oh technical error shouldn't have done that so always happens with our demos right but um, so we can answer the questions and save it, you know, and go through that. Now, one thing that's kind of neat is if, you know, I'm showing to you this onto a desktop, you know, Fiori will resize itself based upon the landscape that you have. So, you know, if I kind of close this browser down to maybe more of a, you know, kind of a slimline thing, you can see it's kind of shrunk everything in. It's going to wrap things as appropriate. And, you know, just because it's HTMI and UI5 compatible, HTML5 compatible, you can start to say, okay, these different columns should have such a percentage of this, et cetera. So what's neat though, is if you go to answer a question, let's say you're on an iPhone and it doesn't think it can go side by side, what it will do is it'll use the whole landscape, the, the whole screen size, you know, to to allow you to answer the question, et cetera. So if you are on a phone, you can see like an iPhone or something like that and trying to do it, you can see how it's a little bit more usable, you know, from it's going to use the real estate you have, it's going to resize itself to the size that, you know, that, that makes sense, et cetera, you know, and I can go back just like that. Um, audits are meant to be quick too. So, you know, one thing, um, that we did and because I went into that, let me back out real quick and come back into this. These technical things always, it's rethinking now. Um, the technical, you know, being live demos and, and doing this with our, our system and demo system are always, always fun to see what's happening. So, um, come on. So it comes back in. I got to actually go back and filter this because for some reason, it, after that technical error, it reset itself. Or if I was locking myself out in the back, back end. But so uh, when I go into here, um, well, why isn't that giving me my? I think the audit's locked because it's not allowing me to do my quick edit. So we'll we'll come back to that here in a second. Um, if I wanted to create a new audit, you know. Um, you know, one of the things we've incorporated in here is, is two features. So I could do, you know, I could create an audit from scratch within the screen as well. So um, this is a guided thing. So it's gonna, you know, what is the audit? So maybe this is, you know, um, 
whatever's my date, 9, 9.23, 2020, it's my brother's birthday, I should remember that, you know, uh, this is a webinar example. So notice as, as I start to fill out the, the fields, it says, okay, let's go to step two. So it's gonna just walk me through this. So what, what type of audit is this? So I can see all the different audit types that we have in here. I can say, okay, it's a supplier audit. Why is my Google Chrome So now I'm just going to go back to my good old keyboard. Oh, and it's just lovely today. So um, let me let me refresh this here real quick. So let's just do this to see if I can make this better. Webinar 923 2020. We'll give it a great description. Go through this. Say it's a supplier audit. Okay, now it's taking it. You know, I could choose the audit trigger, so that maybe this is a follow-up based upon what I did, and I could also choose the different question list that might be have that might be in the system. So, I can do this, and and because it was a supplier audit, I could put in the supplier number if I knew it. Um, you know, we'll show you the calibration thing. How we have built-in access to the back end, and then, you know, I could provide any comments in here, et cetera. Now, if I hit review, it's going to go back in the save, back end and save this, you know, um, so, you know, it would create the audit. Um, if I wanted to do, if I was lazy and didn't want to go through all those steps, one thing I could also do is do this copy from feature up here. Um, and what this allows me to do is to choose an audit, maybe, um, that I might want to to copy from. So, on the left hand side, we have different things. And one of the things we try to do with our implementations is set up templates. And if I can remember the nomenclature, T star. Um, down here at the bottom, maybe I have a template set up. So, what we can do is we can see the different audits, the different templates we have set up, and we can, you know, drag and drop that here, which will then bring in that information. So, it's bringing in the, the audit thing. So, again, I could, I could do whatever I wanted. However, my thing is set up, we can set up that to be internal and this is maybe this is a demo, but it, it brought in some pieces of information for me, my audit type, the trigger, you know, the question list again, uh, that I might choose, you know, the vendor and, and any comments and, and then it would go out and create it. The thought process is if I'm doing like self assessments or, um, you know, where I might need to create multiple things on the fly, providing a quick and easy way to, to create that, you know, on the fly without actually necessarily having to go back to the desktop. Um, let's actually throw caution to the wind and see if we can do this. And I don't know if Nancy has Bob here, but uh, I did this for Bob one time. Bob likes ice cream. Those are my favorite is to, to do that. But notice here for a quick edit, if I was going to enter an audit, what we could, we've incorporated is just brings a lot of things in. So, you know, from here, you can, you know, just quickly easily go through, you know, this, and if you're on, on a tablet or something, the ability just to toggle things and stuff like that, or, or create a Kappa, you know, you know, give it, you know, quick action and things like that. Save a description of the Kappa. Again, the, from a use case, from a mobility perspective, it's supposed to be quick and easy, you know, uh, and, you know, personally, you know, uh, our developer originally came up with that split screen. I like the the quick edit, the, the ability to do multiple things all at the same time, you know, on a tablet or something, go click, 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 you know, um, you know, uh, and conduct that audit, you know, fairly quick and then provide information that I would need to. If I wanted to enter in comments on this, I could save the information, click into the, the split screen, go into the comments, et cetera, where I could then type that out, et cetera, and then it allows me to do that. So um, it's kind of basically the use case of what we put together here. Are there any questions on the on the audit app before we kind of show you the calibration piece? And hopefully we'll save some some time at the end for questions, but yeah, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Or shoot yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Looks good so far. Okay. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Carl, do you want me to display the, the slide deck real quick or do you want to do that? Uh, you can do the slide deck and then uh, I'll take over once I start sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, this is Nancy Cochran. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hey, Mike, is, uh, did you say that that audit app, uh, you can use that on a tablet, on an iPhone? I mean, what kind of devices? It's really device agnostic. I, I think, you know, when you get into the iPhone, you just are getting into real estate problems because there just isn't much, you know, especially when you have, 
criteria for your audit is maybe somebody from quality once told me when I was up in Akron, there's, you know, very detailed criteria that you need to see. So you could do it on, on any, any basically device. It's, it's basically a, a browser based thing. So it's device agnostic. Um, it will resize itself at some level, but when you get tiny into um, the thing, and I can show you this, um, if I go back to this, uh, let me, did I, oh, back here. So if I'm in an audit like this, um, one of the things you can go do in Chrome, Carl showed me this yesterday, is you can go into developer tools. Um, and when you do this here, you can you can choose this device it happens to be. So let's just say you just bought that new fancy iPhone X. See what happens is, you know, you just run out of real estate, you know. So right. okay. it will resize itself and stuff like that. And if you actually clicked on a, a question, it should... Uh, uh, Oh, I was in quick edit mode, so still so, but you know, it would, it would do it. So it's, you know, you can do it, but I mean, until you get really into like, you know, some sort of tablet or something like that. Um, and, you know, obviously these developer tools aren't the best to, to, to do that. In fact, when you actually design these, you can, if you do want to design it for a smaller device in the developer's tool, you can, you can set it to that and say, okay, how does this look? You know, what if we turn this landscape, how does it work then? And what can we see? So you, you do have the ability to develop it and to, to get it for a smaller thing. This, the problem we've always had is real estate, you know, so, but great question. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's slick. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions or Carl? Yeah, we're going to go through calibrations and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions on, on both. Um, so the two topics that we had in the, in the webinar here was audit management and calibrations. As Mike stated earlier, both are standard functionality in your SAP ERP system, whether you're on ECC or S4 or HANA. Um, so calibrations is also a standard SAP functionality. You can do it in the, in the SAP GUI, the graphical user interface. Um, for those of you that have seen calibrations in SAP, it's not its own module. You're not going to find a, a menu path that says anything about calibrations. What you're going to do is you're going to find information in both plant maintenance, the, the PM module, and QM, the quality management module. So the plant maintenance integration is really what drives this functionality because you're doing uh, essentially inspections on an equipment or a functional location. So where normally in quality, right, we're inspecting a material and, and we've got a QM view of a material master. Now we've got an equipment master, for example, a piece of test equipment, like in the picture, a, a caliper or a micrometer or something like that, maybe a scale or a gauge that we're calibrating. So we're calibrating a piece of equipment and those things in SAP will have an equipment master. We can also do an inspection on a functional location. So if like there's a, you know, a water, um, you know, location or well site that we want to do inspection on. So uh, equipment or functional location based. And we've got plant maintenance master data that's really the foundation of this, right? So the equipment masters, the locations, then we've got a, a, a maintenance task list or a general task list, which is equivalent to our inspection plan. We're going to put our inspection data and we've got maintenance plans that will drive our scheduling, right? Time-based or, or usage-based. Uh, we've got a maintenance order that's going to be essentially a work order for that calibration. And then the QM component is where we have our inspection lot, where it's going to, uh, just like a, a material-based inspection lot, we'll have an inspection lot for the equipment where we can record our readings. And that's where we can record um, as found and as left readings. So if you want to capture the calibration readings as you found that equipment, and then as you left it, the two sets of readings, you can do that. Or if you just want one set of readings, that's fine as well. Then we'll make our usage decision, our final decision based on those readings. That will close that uh, maintenance order or calibration order. And then we can see our history in the system as well. So that's sort of the SAP standard stuff. Um, you know, again, there's multiple components to that. So I like to sort of lay it out in a, a, a hierarchy or a graphic so you can see what's sort of driving this. So on the top end there where it says planning, that's all your master data. We talked about some of those components of master data. You've got your task list uh, where, where you're gonna put all your different uh, readings or inspections you're gonna do on it. Um, you know, whether they're quantitative or qualitative, you've got your calibration or maintenance plan for your scheduling, you've got your equipment master. Uh, so that's all your master data in the top. And then the processing is what you're doing day to day, right, in your, um, in your metrology lab or your calibration lab, is something happens to, where you're going to basically uh, get the scheduling. Let's just say you calibrate that piece of equipment every two weeks. 
So you've got the, the scheduling and that plan. Basically, that's going to kick off your plant maintenance order or that calibration work order. That work order uh, on the release is going to create an inspection lot. You're going to record your readings, uh, your as found and your as left readings. If something's out of spec, you can create a, a quality or a plant maintenance notification for the, you know, the failures or the non-conformances. And then at the end, you'll make a usage decision. Okay, so the processing sort of the middle, the final uh, usage decision then can feed all your information structures for, you know, reporting basically. So that's, that's the setup, right? Um, and again, this can all be done in standard SAP GUI, but what we found is again, like Mike was talking about, uh, usability and mobility is key, right? So, uh, you know, for example, if you're calibrating those pieces of equipment in your plant on site, it's nice if I can just carry, uh, you know, a device like a laptop or an iPad Pro or, or uh, you know, Surface um, laptop over to where the equipment is and calibrate it on site, right? Especially if it's a big heavy piece of equipment. Or in the lab, you can have another handheld device, again, running Fioris for the ease of use and the mobility piece. So if we go to the next screen here. Yeah, I was just gonna say one of the things I've always, the biggest complaint I've had is if you look at this, you know, you, you know, there's lots of different transactions. So equipment is IEO2, IEO3, or IHO8. You've got your IPO2, you know, your maintenance plan, you have IO6, 7 for your task list, et cetera, plus all your stuff. And then when you get into here, you have your IW38 for your work orders, your QA32s, QE51s for your results recording. You also have IP10 for your schedule, you know, so there's just a lot of different transactions that doesn't allow it to be strung along, so. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's you know, some of the pain points that we heard from the customers. So the way we wanted to address that was to say, let's, let's try to simplify that. And how do you simplify to the, in today's SAP environment? You do it with Fiori apps, right? And as we showed with the uh, audit apps, the Fiori apps are cross-platform, right? So when you develop in Fiori, it's an HTML5 system where you basically, you can write it once to deploy it anywhere. So whether I'm running Google Chrome or, you know, Internet Explorer Edge, or I've got an Android device or an iOS, iOS device, they all work uh, with the one set of code that we wrote in the Fiori app. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. This is a, a, um, basically a screen print in the presentation that we'll share with you. But I'm gonna go ahead and share my live screen because Mike and I are suckers for doing live demos. <laughs> I will, uh, while he's transitioning to that too, is if there's anybody in the food, pharma, medical device field, we've piggybacked onto this solution and piggybacked with uh, calibrations and stability to do a really slick solution around environmental monitoring. So whether that be utility testing for water or air surface testing, et cetera, for, you know, different micros, et cetera, we have a super slick solution that actually we presented to SAP. So if you have any interest in that, just let us know and we can share it. Thanks, Mike. Can you see my screen now? Just want to make sure. Yep. Okay. So just like Mike was showing, we're running these apps on SAP Cloud Platform. Uh, one of the advantages of that is uh, we don't have an internal Fiori environment set up on our NetWeaver server, so we can run cloud platform in the cloud, use what's called the cloud connector to connect to our backend ECC6 system and have apps in Fiori. So you can see this calibration of equipment is here. We can also deploy these on an internal uh, Fiori uh, gateway uh, you know, on site as well. Uh, but this way we basically have a cloud-based system uh, that can be basically brought up anywhere, but it's connected to an ECC system or it could be an S4 system. So when I click on the calibration of equipment, oh, I've timed out. Let me just uh, start another session here. All right, so I logged in again here. We'll click on the calibration app here. And now we're in. Okay, so uh, just like we saw in the audit app, Really the starting point on this is a work list, right? So we got a work list of equipment. Uh, you can see some of the features are we can use the, the filter bar. Maybe we want to, uh, you know, filter on just a certain piece of equipment or certain maintenance plants. We can hide that filter bar if we want. We can show it. Um, we can also filter by different things graphically. So we're using a user status here to show, you know, all orders, maybe ones that are due soon or ones that are overdue, right? So if I click on this overdue list, you'll see these four, right? Nobody's ever overdue on stuff, but I've got to catch up. I've got four to do here and you, you can see the due dates uh, when they're due, okay? So some are pretty old, some are newer. 
We can also show different uh, fields on here. So just like in a work list in SAP, we've got this settings button. So we could click on settings and say, you know what, I want to bring in that accuracy um, piece that I've maintained in the equipment master. And now I can see that in my field. So we can dynamically add stuff. And it's actually even, you know, much quicker than, than doing that in the variants in SAP. So we can look and see that, add that different fields to our list, okay? Uh, and then when I've got the equipment I want to do, I'm going to concentrate on this, um, this particular one, 108060. Uh, you can see, so it's a, it's a scale, and Hercules is the manufacturer, got a model number, we got the plan it's at, it's overdue. So I can click on that piece of equipment, and now it will bring me into uh, a screen where I can see some more detail about what the equipment is, uh, what calibration info there is, and some history. Uh, again, this is all going against the back end. So uh, let's see, I've got my back end up here just to show you. Uh, so this is an ECC6 system, um, like we talked about earlier. And I can go into just my equipment master. And this is the equipment that we're doing just to show you where it's coming from. So manufacturer, model number, serial number. And then you can see what we're doing is we've got some calibration data here uh, where we're bringing it in via classification. So we've got some custom uh, classification values that we're storing, again, for ease of use so that we can see that data all on one screen in the Fiori app, uh, but we also have it in the, in the graphical user interface in the SAP GUI, okay? So there's some data. You can see some of those fields that we grab, like the accuracy or the range or whatever comes from here. And then we go down to our calibration history. And so what you'll see is those work orders, those uh, plant maintenance work orders that we talked about before, that we've got a calibration order type. We've got the due date, completed date, the inspection lot, and this is the one that's due right now, right? So if I click on this particular one, I can go into that order. And so again, without having to remember all those transaction codes or menus, I'm going right into basically results recording uh, to do my, you know, as found and my as left readings for this particular uh, equipment, okay? Uh, actually, I'll go back one screen. Uh, there is a feature on here where if you want to do a manual call, so uh, these orders are created automatically by the schedule, but for example, if you maybe you dropped it, you just need to do a manual inspection, we could just click that button and that would create you one in a manual call right from that screen, okay? So, but I've got this one created and you can see, um, the little uh, beaker here, we're, we're down at the bottom. We haven't quite filled it up. So as we progress, this will kind of move up to being completed. <laughs> Just a little graphical thing the developer had a lot of fun with. So we go into edit mode and then we can start doing our reading. So again, it's a scale that we're calibrating. So we're gonna you know, put weight at zero grams, 15 grams, 50 grams, 85 grams, 100 grams. You'll notice we're using not only lower and upper tolerance limits, we're using some uh, adjustment limits and what we're using is the different pairs of uh, limits in our quantitative characteristic to store that data. Um, and then we'll put our as found reading. So if we look at the limit minus one to one, uh, let's just say it's whatever 0.8. And we'll just say it's uh, zero. Okay. And then we'll put in a reading here. Let's say it's 15. I'll just make them pass. Eight, five, and 100. Okay, and then those are our as found readings. We do have a feature that if you want to copy those over to your as left readings, you can just hit this button and copy them over. Okay, and then we can record our standards used. So if our, uh, our piece of uh, reference standard equipment that we used, we can use that. We typically have those as set up as different equipment masters with a different equipment type for our reference standards. So we could store that. Typically we'll scan that in from a, a barcode. Um, I don't have that and it's not required. So I'm gonna hit save. And what you'll see is on save, we're doing a, um, we're recording the result and we're also calling the standard SAP function to see if it passes or fails. So notice the green check next to each passing result. If we had a failing result, we would get a circle with a red X in it, okay? My beaker is starting to fill up now. I'm at, uh, you know, 75% on the yellow here. And then when I'm done uh, and I want to make my usage decision, uh, right from here, I can go to the usage decision button. So everything passed, I've got my as found and as re left readings. 
I, I will p point out a feature here if we want to download those readings. Uh, we can click a simple button to download those readings and we can make a usage decision. I mean, I'll point out here, especially if you're in, uh, you know, a, a regulated environment uh, and we're, you know, making the usage decision, uh, we might want a digital signature for our um, CFR Part 11 compliance. So this is calling a digital signature. This is something we had to do special. The Fiori um, apps uh, by default don't support that, uh, but this was something that we needed to do for an FDA requirement. So we've got the ability to do the simple signature, which is two unique forms of ID, which is your SAP username and your password. So hopefully I get that right and I will hit accept. Now we can configure it to read the selected sets, the different UD codes. <laughs> I love this Google thing, data breach with my password. All right, we'll close that. Uh, and you can see now the usage decision is complete and now our beaker is all green. And we are done with that one. And if we go back to our history, um, let's just go back one screen and come back into that one. We'll go back to all. And now you can see that that one was completed um, and it's not on my overdue list anymore. So if I refresh and go back to my overdue list, I'll just go back home and let's go back into there and refresh. Oops timed out again, sorry. Let's go back in there. And calibrations should come off my list if we're lucky here. Oh. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe there's an older one that's still due. Oh, okay, it's reading an older one. So that was the one we just did, but there's, uh, there's some older ones down here that somebody still hasn't done anyways. But uh, that's, a, that's a quick, uh, you know, demonstration of the app. Basically, uh, as we saw, there's a, a work list where we can have a configurable work list of all your different equipments, you know, bring in the different fields from the equipment master and the scheduling. Uh, once we go into that, we've got a display coming out of the equipment master and, and the classification data. And then we can live go in and record results. So again, now I've got a different piece of equipment here. You'll notice the different limits. So it's reading everything live in SAP. You know, the back end is still the back end data in SAP. Um, once it's recorded all of that data, actually, let's just go into QA13 and we'll uh, look at the usage decision that was done on that last one. Let's see, it was, let's go back one screen. Go to all. It was, you can see the inspection lot there. So uh, 5410. And you can see those were my readings. They were all accepted. My equipment master as found and as left readings and my usage decision was accepted in tolerance. That will also, uh, as you know, uh, with a follow-up action, close that work order, that calibration order would be T-code or completed um, based on that usage decision. And that would update the scheduling. And now, you know, two weeks from now, I'd get another one. So um, that's the calibration app. Um, Carl, refresh your list again. Oh, yep. Yeah. Let's go ahead and refresh. Just, is there a button? I just use the Google refresh. Oh, okay. That one. You're just oh. forcing it to go read SAP. So now it's, now it's calibrated. Ah, now so it's we're using the user status on the, on the equipment master and we don't have the follow-up action I actually updating it at the per current uh -huh. time. So we, <laughs> we auto magically went ahead and updated it. Maybe somebody else that knows how to use IAU too, or maybe me, uh, <laughs> but it, so you see how, to, how it is dynamic in real time. And, you know, based upon the implementation, we would have that being done automatically in the yeah, background. He's done the follow-up action. Cool. So those are the screenshots in the presentation that we'll share with you. Uh, you know, the, uh, basically the work list, going into you know, the equipment and the information and the history. You have your as found and as left readings and recording results and then making the usage decision.
Um, we'll we'll take questions, but before we do, I'll just uh, show you. We'll, we'll basically um, put the recording of this out on Dropbox and share that link with everybody. Um, we'll also probably just put it on our YouTube channel. If that's even easier, you can just go to this YouTube channel and, um, and you can watch it, watch it there. And then uh, just like we did for this one, we send out you know, our future webinars via our uh, MailChimp email uh, service. So as long as you're on that distribution list, you, know, you can unsubscribe if, if you want, but uh, as long as you're on there, you'll get the future emails for us for that. And if anybody has any, any topics that they specifically want to see, we'd be happy to do it. A lot of times we think, okay, what would people be interested in seeing? But if you, you're willing to say today, hey, I'd like to see you know, something on notifications or this, that, we'll, we'll we want to start doing some more of these just because find ourselves with extra time in the office. So if you have great ideas or areas that you'd like to see, you know, just let us know and we'll be happy to put something together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll take the last, you know, five minutes here, just uh, any questions, uh, you know, anything in general, if there's a topic that, uh, you know, quality calibration, audit, uh, just anything for the next webinar, you know, feel free to ask. Hey, hey, Carl, this is Jim Farwick. A quick question. You mentioned the user status on that uh, equipment. Yeah. Uh, does that basically indicate that it's in a state of calibration or not? Yeah, let me look at what we've got set up on here. So we've got and I, I'm gathering from your UD follow-up action, you can set that user status. Correct. A lot of times, Jim, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we do it actually off of the maintenance plan user exit. And a lot of times, so like if it's coming due, if it's within like six weeks, well, if Carl hit, the, hit your eye to the right of the cow, if, you know, this is kind of, I think this one's kind of the baseline, but we'll say overdue limited caliber out for service, et cetera, um, you know, do not use. We can also have, an, you know, there's got the overdue service or status. So depending on, on what, what status is, what you want to be able to see, we would set this, this is a configurable item. And a lot of times it'll set like coming due or overdue, you know, um, automatically by the system. System, and then the follow-up action will set it back to a calibrated status as well. Yeah, I was wondering what's the what's the activity that that causes the to be set user status to say, hey, it's not in a state of calibration. Like, what's is there um what's what's the breakpoint there that that because it's time based, I presume, right? That's time based, but if you had so if in your use case, if you wanted to say, okay, it's been delivered to a lab and it's sitting now waiting to be calibrated or something like that, you could build that out and then make that part of your business process, and the status would be set accordingly. Like Depending a custom background job, or like how how are you getting that right now? It's a, right now, it's a user exit to set uh, coming due as well as overdue. A user uh, user exit off the maintenance plan schedule, and the. Uh, to set it back to a calibrated status is off of the usage decision follow-up action. Yeah, so we we have sort of a custom thing in here where we're using some dates that get set um, in, the, in the classification with the calibration date and the next due date. It's reading the data that Mike talked about. And normally these are display only fields and there's a custom background that says, go out and read the last date. So this would be the last date of calibration. Since I just did it today, it would have filled in after the usage decision. <clears throat> excuse me, as uh, September 23rd. And then it would read, you know, the next due date from the timing of the maintenance plan and bring that in here. Um, and then that's can update the, the user statuses. This is the, the standard uh, system status on the equipment doesn't have a lot, right? It's just like available. Uh, I think there's, a, there's one you can call it like out of service or something. I forget the... Uh, um, the other one. I so presume your customers that use this would... would would want to report that shows, you know, what's, what's coming up. That's going to be, is that anything special there that, that that's worth mentioning on how such a, since you have some customization here to, to build this and, and such a report that just, uh, how is it, how does that work? You could do it standard off of like IP 24, which is a, is, is a maintenance plan scheduling transaction to see what's coming due. That's always been the challenges because you have so many, you know, PM or plant maintenance transactions and QM transactions, you know, getting people to the right thing. That's why one of the best practices I found was pushing the dates off of the schedule back to the equipment master so they could go into IHO8 and see, hey, what's coming due that I own. I um, see. We made it we made it a little bit simpler in the Fiori app with that coming due status. Now we're basing that off of that user status, and we're we're, we're automating that to get that status set accordingly. But I could also do a standard. I mean, 
I could do a standard off of like an IP24, which is that scheduling transaction. I could also do it standard off of like an IW38 because I may set my call horizon to generate the work order four weeks early or something like that. And then by virtue of anything that's on that list, that's not overdue mm. is quote unquote coming due. So right. depending, I see. again, how you want to attack that, but Got it. The, 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 the due status was, was really is like that coming due. It's, it's everything that's been called, but not overdue. Okay, cool. And I have customers that want to do that six weeks out, some four weeks out, some two weeks out. It you know, just depends on how you want to schedule that, you know, so. Any other questions from anybody? We've got a couple of minutes left here. This is Joey Liskin from Afton. Uh, quick question, if you got time. I'm not familiar with the cloud and the Fiori portion. We're running an ECC6 right now. But for access to this, you guys showed going through and updating your, your as found as left values. If somebody's in the back end system, at what point does Fort Fury app basically put you in a edit versus a display so that we don't have conflicts on on uh, Great the data fields? Can you guys give a quick quick background on that? Yeah, one of the nice things that when you're in Fiori, um, you you gotta gotta you gotta anticipate that, right? So, a lot of times we will only lock the record when we're making that call back to to update the results, you know, uh, by default. So, because a lot of times we may have, like, w audit was a big thing, you know, and this is one of the requirements actually that Nancy had was that there could be multiple auditors working on the same audit at the same time. They would be doing, working on different questions and different. Uh, different sections, but if we were to lock the whole audit out, then I couldn't enter in my part, even though because Nancy was in there. So what we do is is really, you know, when 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 you do different, basically, you know, click different buttons and you're saving it or something like that. Only then does when we call that that back in O data service does SAP lock the record, you know, make the call to what it needs. To to do and then release the record and if something is locked it'll say hey i can't i can't update this you know right now you need to try it again etc so you don't lose that you know um, and one kind of nice thing is that is that the browser isn't going to time out as quickly you can time out on fiori still just based upon your back end but you got a little bit more flexibility there so you don't necessarily quote unquote lose information but really the only time we're locking it is when we're making those callbacks to to record information which allows it to be open that much more so multiple people can do things. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. So there are some locks, I guess, a, a summary. Um, but yeah, the timing of when you, when you lock the record is important. Oops. Anything else from anybody? If not, we will thank everybody for their time today. Yeah, we're right at uh, one thirty Eastern here. So uh, appreciate everybody coming. And uh, like I said, we'll uh, we'll post uh, maybe a follow up email uh, with the link to the uh, to the recording or the um, on Dropbox and um, also the YouTube channel. And then again, please feel free to send us a topic for what you want to see next time. We sort of, uh, you know, have to invent a topic. And, you know, I think these were two that customers had expressed to us some interest in, but uh, if there's something specific uh, you want us to cover, feel free to shoot, uh, shoot an email to, uh, to Mike or I or, or anybody on the QMS team. And uh, we'll, we'll consider that as something for next time. You can send it to this SAP at qmsinc.com as well. That's an easy one that goes to a lot of people. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm Thank you. In the recording and stop the sharing here and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Right, have a good one. Later. All right. Cheers.